Okay, we're up to chapter 3, verse 9. <coughs> So, Adam and Chava in the garden, and they ate from the tree, and let's just look at verse 8, because I'm going to comment on the connection between them. They heard the sound, this is page 17, they heard the sound of Hashem God manifesting itself in the garden. Towards evening, the word, word manifesting in the English is not bad, but the literal Hebrew is strolling. Strolling. Of course, a sound can't stroll, but that's the, what the word says, so we'll have to ask exactly what it means. And we'll, we'll, I'll try to explain it to you with, uh, in a little bit. We're on page 17, verse 8. Um, and the man and his wife hid from Hashem God among the trees of the garden. Now, there's a problem here, which we will talk about in a few minutes. The problem is the hiding from the creator of the universe in the trees. Like, you know, what, what's, and as we say in the world, what's the Like, what, what do you think? Do you think I can't see you because you're in the trees? <laughs> what, kind of thing, what kind of thing is that? <laughs> what kind of idea is that? And where is that coming from? And you'll see that it's coming from a very deep place. But okay, now, Hashem God called out to the man and said, Where are you? And that raises another obvious question. Does God really not know where he is? Usually, if someone's hiding... And somebody else says, where are you? That indicates he doesn't know where he is. He's trying to find out. So Rashi says right away, this is on the, on the back of the page. He knew where he was. The first one, the capital H, and the second one, the little H. God knew where Adam was. But he asked him this in order to enter into conversation with him, lest he be frightened to answer if should punish him suddenly. It's a midrash. What we would have expected, naively, is a God to say, You're finished! <laughs> you ate from the tree, you're hiding. Come on, who are you hiding from? You're finished! But that's, that would preclude the kind of response that God would want. And Rashi says, the same thing is true in the story of Cain and Abel, which we will look at in Yitz Hashem. Same thing is true there. Cain kills Abel. God comes to Cain and says, where's your brother Abel? He knows where he is. And so with Bilam, when Bilam wants to, to, to curse the Jewish people, to destroy them, God comes to him in a dream and says, who are these men with you? So Rashi says, for the purpose of entering into a conversation with them, so with Chizkiah, in another case in Tanakh, to open up a conversation, to open up a discussion about a subject in a way that won't frighten the person, that could get his attention, that could perhaps induce him to think about where he is, what he's doing, and why he's doing it, and what its consequences are and maybe to change his attitude towards it, maybe to come to realize he's done something wrong, and to, and to apologize. Whereas if you simply condemn a person, he's finished. You know, he knows that he's finished. And I think, although Rashi doesn't say it directly, I think that we could hear, in the word here, a, 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 a hint of this idea. What does God ask him? Where are you? Where are you? Not just physically. Where are you legally? Where are you morally? Where are you spiritually? Where are you now? The hope was that Adam would say, you're right. I'm not where I was. 
Uh, my situation has changed. I see better now what I did, uh, the, which I didn't appreciate when I made the decision, to get him to think again. Same thing with, with, um, with Hevel and Cain. God says to Cain, where is your brother? Hmm, where is he? He's dead. He's dead because I killed him. That's where he is. Hmm, is that right? Is that appropriate? Is that justifiable? What are the consequences? Who am I? This is the kind of stimulus to get the person to think. And Rashi says, as he said several times so far in the commentary that we've seen, that it's teaching you a certain responsibility you have for people. When somebody does something wrong, don't just lower the boom on him. Don't just condemn him. Try to interact with him in such a way that he himself will come to see something's gone wrong, and maybe he'll take responsibility for it. That's the way God dealt with these, with these two people. So that's Rashi's comment on, on the question. Yeah. I just wanted to share that I learned from the source that the uh, AK is also the hint for the word 25 of the Torah, which is or. AK is like the where is, like the hint is like where is your light? Oh. Because it's the 25th word of the Torah, and Kaf A is 25, so there is. Oh, I see. Ah. Where is 25? Yes, 25, first. 25. I see. A okay, okay, that's very interesting. 25 is a or. Very interesting. Okay. But, uh -huh. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. Now, I want to explain, since Rashi linked these incidents, I want to explain the answer to the question in verse 8. I think this is a really crucial piece of, of understanding how God run, deals with the world. Many commentaries point about, talk about this. God is, we say, infinite, transcendent, beyond, you know. How can God possibly interact with us? We are finite, and even if you say the soul has special properties, the commentaries all agree that the soul, as connected to the body, loses its transcendent qualities. They aren't available to it. They're not accessible to it. You can't access them. How is God going to relate to us? Only by relating to us with a tiny sliver of what he is. If he relates to us with all of what he is, there will be no relationship. There'll be no interaction. There'll be no sharing. There'll be just something coming out of the blue. So the uh, example that everyone gives is a teacher and a student or a parent with a child. You know, when your six-year-old asks you, Abba, when I press the button, why does the light go on? You're not going to talk to him about copper atoms with free electrons, an electron source, an electron sink, you know, you give him some very simplified story in physical terms that he's used to, and you, you tell him, when you're older, you'll learn better what it really is. This is the, I can only tell you this because this is all you can understand. So God does the same thing with us. When he interacts with us, he wants to have a relationship with us. That means he's got to, so to speak, project himself to us on our level. Now, projecting himself to us on our level means leaving out of the interaction the rest of his infinity. Hmm. How much does he leave out? And how much does he use? And is always the same picture? Always leaves out the same amount? He always uses the same amount? Maybe under different circumstances? He leaves out more? Leaves out less? Now go back to verse 8. It says, they heard the sound of Hashem God strolling in the garden. The literal word in the Hebrew is strolling. Someone who strolls is in one place. Not all over. Not occupying the entire environment. Someone who strolls is in one place. Which means that they heard a rustling in the garden over there. A rustling in the garden over there someplace, and that was God manifesting himself over there. 
Why would he do that? Why would he manifest himself over there? And the answer is, it was a signal. In this interaction with you, I'm not going to use my omnipresence and my omniscience. I'm not going to use them. I am everywhere. And I know everything. But I'm not going to use my being everywhere. I'm not going to use my knowing everything. I'm not going to use them. So they said, aha, you're not going to use them. He's going to interact with us as if he were localized over there. Then we can hide over here. Hmm. Not trying to fool the omniscient, omnipresent God. But he's not going to use it. He's telling us that. He's giving us a signal. He's not going to use it. So then we can indeed hide over here. And we won't lose thereby. And God goes along with it. He says, where are you? He doesn't say, don't be stupid, get out of there, I know where you are. <laughs> he doesn't do that. Because he signaled to them that he wasn't going to use that. Nothing primitive or childish or unsophisticated about the position, on the contrary. And this is the same background for Cain, where God says to him, where is your, 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 your brother Hevel? He says to himself, why is God asking why is he asking? He, of course, knows. He's the creator of the universe. But if he's asking me, what he's telling me is he's not going to use his knowledge. Then I can get away with it. And I can say, I don't know. Now, in that case, God, so to speak, double crosses him. God says, I know where he is. His voice is crying to me from the ground. It goes on for, for a different reason. But this is a general principle that all interactions with God require God to live it himself, so to speak, Drastically, you know, infinity minus any finite amount is still infinity. So it doesn't become any smaller. It just doesn't use some part, but the, 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 same, the size remains the same. Um, and this is the answer to another question when um, Moses is at the burning bush and God says to Moses, go down to Egypt and be my agent for, uh, for the exodus. And Moses has a lot of objections. And one of his objections is that I tell them, um, you know, that when, I, when I tell them that, that that's the uh, assignment I've been given, they're going to say, what, you say God appeared to you? What is his name? So Moses says to God, when I go down and tell them I've been assigned to take them out of Egypt, they're going, assigned by God to take them out of Egypt, they're going to say to me, what is God's name? So Moses says to God, what shall I tell them? Now, Maimonides, in quoting this passage, says, the way it's being described, that's a really foolish question. That's a really foolish question. Moses imagines that they're going to ask, ask him, what is God's name? What, are our, what would Moses' options be? Tell them a name that they do know or tell them a name that they don't know? Those are only two possibilities, right? If he tells them a name that they do know, so then, like they know it, he knows it, and so what? If they tell them a name, if he tells them a name they don't know, they'll say, you're lying. Who says that's his name? How could this be the question that Moses anticipates they're asking? Tell us his name. The question is a nonsensical question. So there are various answers to Maimonides' challenge. Maimonides' challenge is, I think, is a straightforward, logical challenge. The Kabbalistic answer, I'm skipping over Moses, Maimonides' answer because it's not relevant to us. The Kabbalistic answer is this. You tell us God sent you down to engineer the Exodus. We know that when God interacts with anything else, he closes off his infinity and uses only a certain part. Which part is he using? What kind of interaction is it? What particular divine principle is behind the interaction? For example, you tell us that he's going to engineer an exodus. Is it mercy for the Jewish people that's running this particular interaction? Or is it judgment against the Egyptians for their crimes that's running the interaction? And it makes a gigantic difference. Because if it's judgment against the Egyptians for their crimes, and God is going to punish them and destroy their power, and we're going to walk free, then we don't have to earn it. They're being punished for their crimes. 
and we'll walk free as a result. But if it's mercy for us, mercy has to be earned. Mercy doesn't come free. Mercy has to be justified. So we're asking you, what divine principle under acts this under, underlies this particular interaction so that we know how, what to expect and we know what our responsibilities are? This is a general principle across the board. Every interaction between God and, and something else has to follow some principle that limits God's infinity to a, to a, a, finite, um, a finite principle that, that can be used for the interaction. That's the way God runs the world. I'm not saying that he has to do it that way, but that's the way he runs the world. He does it that way. Rabbi Chal talks about this. Others talk about this. So in this case, where they hide, they have reason to think that God's not going to use his omnipresence and his omniscience in the interaction. He advertised himself as being localized over there, so that's why they hide. And that's why then, then God says, where are you? He's following up on the, what he committed himself to do in this case. Yeah. Is hiding the same idea as, um, I don't know what word it uses for hiding, but is it nelam, like the idea of concealing? The nelam often means absent. The word here is vayit chabay. Vayit chabay means just to hide. Doesn't mean to be absent. Okay, that's um, okay. So now uh, God uh, uh, he, he asked them if they ate from the tree, and uh, now you have this this uh, fabulous um, uh, interaction here. So um, verse eleven and, and seventeen. So. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, where are you? That's 10. I heard, he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. There he is. He's, he's citing it. I heard the sound. And I was afraid because I'm naked and I hid. So, you know, the, the naive reader, which includes academia, the naive reader says, well, I heard, so I was afraid. He's coming, you know, and he's, uh, and he said, I want to be, I don't want to escape, so I, so I hid. I'm telling you the connection between hearing the sound and hiding is much deeper than that. Because if the creator of the universe is coming, you can't hide. There's no place to hide from the creator of the universe. So the verse is saying much more than that. I heard the sound of you over there, and I learned from that that in this interaction, you're going to interact with me as if you're only over there, and that's how I knew hiding would be effective. So, Hashem said to them, who, to, said to them, who told you that you were naked? We saw already. When he says he opened his eyes, it means he gave him wisdom. A blind man knows when he's, wake, when he's naked, Rashi pointed out. So you must have learned something. You must have come to understand something about your condition. Hmm. If there's been a change in your understanding, maybe you ate from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which by eating from it will change your knowledge that now you know something you didn't know before? Is it that because you ate from the tree? Mm. You see how the concepts fit together? I and mean, I think they fit together exquisitely. Now, here comes a test. I've given this test on four continents. <laughs> the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Mm. What is Adam's response? Blaming. What is Adam's response to God's question? It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. She gave it to me. It's her fault, right? <laughs> now read it again. Read the verse again to yourself. And tell me what his answer is. You gave it to me, the woman. So therefore, what's his answer? Blaming Hashem. It's your fault! <laughs> Not her fault, it's your fault! Wow. The woman, wow. wow, is right. All you have to do is read it twice. All you have to do is read it twice. I tell you, I've done this on four continents. Everybody gets asked the second reading. Is it, because it says, the woman whom you gave to be with me. What's that doing there? What's that, whom you gave to be with me? What's that doing there? 
And he's saying, I trusted her, you put her here. So I thought she had some validity to her. And I, and I, and I followed her. This is a good example of how the real meaning is right there in the words. It's right there in the words. It's just, you read it, you have something in mind, and you're focused only on this and not on that, and you miss that, you know, and then, uh, all you have to tell it now, what does Rashi say? The one whom you gave to be with me, Rashi comments, here he, Adam, showed his ingratitude. Because Rashi got it straight. He's blaming God for the... He, she, you gave it to me, and she, she gave it to me, and then, then I followed her, and so on and so on. That means to say, you gave it to me, and I suffered through her, and it's your fault, and... So instead of taking responsibility for his own decision, you know, I, I saw somebody who claims to be an Orthodox rabbi and put out a book, and, uh, and he said, here Adam responds like, an, like a young, an, an immature adolescent, you know, blaming the other guy. Would you blame him? Would you uh, say, if he, if he told you to jump off the roof, would you jump off the roof? You know. <laughs> Sorry. That's not what the book says. Anyway, so that's, that's Rashi, and that's the, that's the message here. Okay, now you have the second pages also? Okay, good. Why, why, why did the place where, where Hashem decided to uh, place the creation at the beginning was the Gan? Why Gan? Why are we related with a garden and not with some other... Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, why then locus is a, is a, a Gan, which means a garden? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's a place which is comfortable, which is beautiful, which provides food to eat, you know, so it's just, there's nothing wrong with this being a garden. But on the other hand, could it have been someplace else, like a, like a palace or something else? I have no reason to, to, to say uh, why it would have to be one rather than the other. I don't know. Um, surrounded by nature, I could make a guess, but I, I really don't know. Okay, now comes a verse about which a great deal has been written, uh, resulting in a great deal of misunderstanding. So, 13. Shem God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And Shem said, the serpent, okay, now the serpent, God hands out curses. So skip down to 16. To the woman he said, <clears throat> I will greatly increase your suffering and your childbearing. In pain shall you bear children. Yet your craving shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. <laughs> Bang! There it is, black on white. Men rule over women, and that's what the Torah is about. And women are chattel, they're second class. At the <laughs> you, know, you, know, you get man the barricades, you know. This is Iran, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, uh, I, have, I have a, a principle. Text first and politics afterwards. <laughs> Let's take a look at what Rashi says on the text. And then we'll have one insight, and then I'll give you another insight that I got from Rabbi Meisel. Um, this is on the Nuru page, 316. Your pain, I'm going to multiply your pain. That is to say, the trouble of rearing children and the conception what it means to be conception that is the pain of pregnancy and in pain you shall bear children that's the pangs of childbirth and to your husband will be your desire for sexual relations and nonetheless, you will not have the temerity, which in plain English means chutzpah, to proposition him. But rather, he will rule over you. Everything will come from him and not from you. 
Now listen. The verse has four parts. I'll increase your suffering, childbearing and pain should bear children, your, ch your craving should be for your husband. This is all about women and children. Mm -hmm. Raising children, being pregnant, giving birth. Your craving should be for your husband. Rashi says for sexual relations, it doesn't mean for sexual pleasure. You will want children. Right. Read the history of the, fem of the feminist movement from the 70s through the 90s and 2000s where they changed their minds. <laughs> where the women who went in at 20 and came out at 40 with no children, and then they said, we're sorry, we understand now that many, many women want children, and we have to have a, du a dual right track for them so they can both have children and also work and child uh, uh, care and so forth and so on. You have to have all of that. You will want to have uh, children. So far, the verse is talking only about Women and children. Mm -hmm. Then it says he shall rule over you. Is it really appropriate in textual terms, in literary terms to say, at this point the verse went from P to Z, skipping all the letters in between, and talked about general control and general authority and general power and general direction. Isn't that a little awkward? Yeah. To go from three statements about women's relationship to children and then say, and the fourth one is, he shall rule over you, he's your master, you're his chattel, you belong to him, he can do what he please, and so forth and so on. <laughs> is that a little awkward? Rashi takes it as all talking about women and uh, women vis-a-vis -vis children. That's the subject of the whole sentence. Mm -hmm. He shall rule over you, as our tradition preserves, that in ancient times, men had multiple women, and they would choose this one to bear me children, and this one for beauty, and I'm making sure that this one doesn't become pregnant. Because she's beautiful. I don't want to spoil her beauty. I don't want to lose that. She can't become pregnant by herself. Everything shall come from you and, and from him and not from you. He will determine whether you become pregnant or not. You will want to have sexual relations with him in such a way as to become pregnant and have a child. And he'll say no. So that would make the sentence <laughs> consistent with a single subject and have nothing to do with the general relationship between husband and wife. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Somebody wants to prove from here that women are subservient to men is fighting against the natural understanding of the verse. That's one thing. And that's what Rashi's doing. I mean, Rashi's just making this verse have, have one continuous connected subject. But it's worse than that. As Rabbi Meisman points out in his book, Jewish Woman and Jewish Law, this verse is a curse. So the oral tradition tells us. The Talmud calls this a curse. What is the status of a curse? In Jewish thinking, what is the status? Is a curse a mitzvah, a rule, a requirement, a law, an obligation, a value, an ideal? Is that what a curse is? Is a curse an inescapable reality, something which God is building into the reality of the world and makes it impossible to overcome? Is that what a curse is? Okay, you say no, and you are correct. It's neither of those two things. How, do you, how, are, how, how are you aware of this? How would you justify someone more skeptical? In which, in which case, which case of a statement which is a curse do you know that you can change the result? You have it right on the page. We read it twice. One of the curses for her is pain in childbirth. childbirth. We can overcome that. We have anesthesia. So number one, it's certainly not an inescapable reality. We have escaped it, thank you. <laughs> and not only that, you will not find anywhere an authority who says... God says you have to suffer. So don't use this anesthesia. It's not right. You know, you're rebelling against God's fate for you that you have to suffer. No. There's no such thing. There's absolutely no such thing. So then, what is a curse? 
A curse is something which is built into the world naturally. It can happen. If special care isn't taken, then it can happen and it will happen. But you should do your best to avoid it. You don't embrace curses. You work as best you can to avoid curses. Just as some of you probably know, because it's in these last week's parashas, it says to Adam that you will be a poor, unsuccessful farmer. You will plant grains, and the, th- the earth will give forth thorns and thistles. That wasn't permanent, was it? When did it get changed? When Noah was born. Right? He'll comfort us from the, the terrible results of, uh, of the crimes of our hands. And it says the plow was invented at that time, and the earth stopped bringing forth <coughs> thorns and thistles. So it's not permanent, and nothing's that you embrace, and something which God can rectify, turn around. And if you think if you will take a, a trip to Flatbush and you will visit the homes of diamond dealers or real estate brokers or so forth and so on, you will not find them as poor farmers scraping the ground for just a bare <laughs> subsistent living, not in the $3 million houses that they live in. Right? And no one says, you're violating Genesis. Living like that, go live on the porch. You know, <laughs> Suffer in the winter with no heat. After all, God wants you to suffer. No, nobody says that. So you have to know that even if the words he will rule over you were understood as the husband ruling over the wife, that's bad. It's a curse. It's bad. The text is telling you is that it's bad. Not good, not right, not appropriate, not an ideal, not a mitzvah. It's bad. And you should avoid it as much as you can. And much of Jewish law that describes the relationship between husband and wife is designed to make sure that the husband does not rule over the wife. So the very opposite of what they want to deduce from this verse is the truth. And I will give you one example. There are many, many examples. I'll give you just one example. Um, Money is very important, as you probably have figured out. (laughs) And in a a husband and wife uh, relationship, what happens with the money? Who earns the money? Who owns the money? How does it work? Okay. There are two different possible arrangements. One arrangement is that the husband alone is responsible for the support of the family. And the wife, if she earns money, the money goes to him. And the certain amount of effort that she should put in, and certain number of things that she should, con- should contribute, but the Monetary support of the family is the responsibility of the husband. That's one arrangement. The other arrangement is that the husband has his uh, earning power, which goes into a bank account that belongs to him, and the wife has her earning power, which goes into an account that belongs to her, and they share the support of the family. And then what she earns belongs to her. Those are the two possible arrangements. Now, how is it determined which arrangement the family shall live by? I'm glad you're all sitting down. The answer is the wife determines it alone. Only her decision counts. He has no input, period. Does that sound like he's ruling over her? Doesn't sound like it to me. She can say if she wants, I don't want to have the responsibility for, for, for supporting the family. Our 16 kids and all the rest of it, paying tuitions to all the schools and everything else, buying all the clothes. Thanks, Dad. You know, wouldn't Marx call him a wage slave? Maybe, um, (laughs) maybe, right? Because he's the guy who's got to go out and bring in the money, and she has responsibility for the house and so on and so on. But the, the, the support of the family is only his responsibility. Or if he's a bus driver and she's an architect, and she's pulling in more money. She says, listen, <laughs> your bank account, I have my bank account. You're earning $100,000 a year. I'm earning $600,000 a year. And we'll share the expenses of the family at $99,000. <laughs> You'll be left with $1,000 for four hundred ninety nine. Yeah, but, but, you know, uh, we can share it that way. And then we have our separate bank accounts. And it's her decision which way it should go. That certainly does not sound like the husband ruling over the wife. That's halacha. Sorry? That's halacha. That's halacha. 
It's actually straight up, straightforward in the Gemara in a dozen different places, and it's codified that way in the Halacha. In the, in the marriage, uh, no, not that's uh, okay. the, the ksuba is something else. Ksuba is something else, and ksuba is all his responsibilities. Meaning that in this interaction where you want to have relations with him so as to become pregnant and bear children, he will be the sole determinant of that, of that outcome. What, I mean, there were two things they used to do. Either they used to have intercourse up to the very last moment and then uh, pull out and, and eject the, the semen on the ground, which is what Aaron Olan did also. That was one way to prevent it. Or there were certain procedures that they could... Yeah, you quite as interrupters, that's right. Aaron, Aaron. What's that? Who, who has the temple? Er and Onan, Yehuda's first two children. Oh. And the other possibility is that certain procedures that a woman could go through, oh. even after intercourse, to, to, try, so, to yeah, try to prevent uh, uh, conception, and he would force her to, uh, to undertake those procedures. So these things were also. Yeah, so, so what? What are we talking about? What's about Usher here? Why are they allowed to do it? Who says they're allowed to do it? They just do it, that's all. That's why I said it's a curse. If this happens, it's a curse. It's something you should avoid as much as possible. Okay? So it's certainly no indication in these words whatsoever that uh, we are, you know, supporting Iran. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Is that, your hands up? Yeah. Yeah. So we have, perhaps, also overcome the, 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 this curse that the women will have the sexual desire for the men because nowadays there are certain procedures with which she can uh, develop a pregnancy without uh, even having the sexual intercourse, right? So, so now, I mean, she needs the seed, but to say so that she can go and buy it in a semen bank or like uh, so. Is that curse? It's also been somehow um, no longer. It's an interesting question whether because she can use IVF or something else. This idea of desiring, I don't, I, I, th I think, because there, there are exceptions to every rule, but I think that <sighs> women, it's a very deep element in women's psychology to crave relationship. Now you say, oh, lady, it's been all fixed. The men invented it. The technology, right? Those wicked men who hate you. They invented the technology so you can do it solo. You do it solo, all by yourself. I think the vast majority of women would say, but I don't want to do it all by myself. I know I could, but I don't, I don't want to be alone. This is something I want to share. I want it to be part of a relationship, part of a commitment. The fact that I can do it physically alone? Sorry, that doesn't, that doesn't compensate me. Oh, thank you very much. Um, okay, that's that. Now, 318. Okay, so we, we said, oh, let's see, uh, I have the Rashi here? Yeah, let's take a look at this. Now, 318 is in the middle of the curse to the man. Uh, it's on page 19. Thorns and thistles shall it sprout for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. You'll eat the grasses of the field. This is part of the curse. So Rashi says, gee, is, it really, is that really a curse? Wasn't that in chapter 1? part of the blessing that God gave to man, that he'll be vegetarian and he'll eat the ground, the, the grasses of the ground, just like the animals do? Why would that be here part of the curse? Look at the Rashi that I quoted for you here. What curse is involved here? Was he not told as a blessing? Behold, I've given to you every herb yielding seed to eat. But what is stated here at the beginning of the passage. So here, the, the curse is not in the um, menu of things he's going to eat. That's not where the curse is. It's that this is the, this, these words are the result of a, law, of a process. Cursed be the ground. In toil shall you eat of it. After all your toil, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to me. And then, through that ter terrible process, you'll eat that. That wasn't what I promised you when I created you. 
that you'll have to plow the ground and you'll go through thorns and thistles and the processing and all the rest. And then at the end of exhausting and unproductive labor that you'll eat it, that wasn't what I promised you. I promised you it'll grow by itself and you just eat it. This means you sow with cereals and vegetables and bring forth thorns and thistles, other weeds, before you have to eat them for lack of other food, whatever, it, whatever the ground gives you. It's, the words sound the same, but the conditions are entirely different. And since the conditions are different, it can be part of, the, part of a curse. We have time for this? Okay. One more that's really very, very important. Um, this is uh, 322. Okay, so having told them this future, uh, the curse for, for each of them, God now expels them from the garden. Look at these words, 22. Shem God said, Behold, man has become like the unique one among us, capital U, which, I, which is, the, if, according to this translation, is the right way to do it. He's referring to God. Knowing good and bad. And now lest he put forth his, his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So Hashem God banished him from the Garden of Eden. Now these words, behold, man has become like the unique one among us, knowing good and bad, these words are subject to a gigantic amount of analysis and, and, understand, and interpretation. Let's see what Rashi writes, and then see if we can understand it, and then if we have time, I'll tell you what the Rambam says. <sighs> is become like one of us, which is one way to read it, not like the translation you saw, or like the being who is one, unique among us. He's become like that one among us. Lo, see, he is unique among the terrestrial ones, even as I am unique among the celestial ones. And in what does his uniqueness consist? Knowing good and evil, which is not so in the case of cattle and beasts. Okay, let's look at the words again. Let me ask you a question, see if I can motivate Rashi for you. Behold, man has become like the unique one among us, knowing good and bad. Do those words imply that God knows good and bad? Yes. That's the way everybody reads it. This knowing good and bad is what makes man and God similar. He's become like us because he now knows good and bad the way God knows no good and bad. So the knowledge of good and bad is what links them. Rashi is denying that. Rashi is denying that. Rashi is saying the link between God and man is that God is unique in the heavens and man is unique below. That's the link. That each one of them is unique in his own circumstances. And then Rashi says, what is it? Oh, the, okay, quotes the verse is saying, what is it that makes man unique below? What makes him different from the animals? That's his knowing good and bad. Man knows the difference between good and bad. The animals do not know the difference between good and bad. That is what makes man unique below, among, in his, his own context, in his own environment. So now, man has become unique in his own environment, knowing good and bad. So he's unique in his environment. Just like God is unique in his environment, however God is unique being infinite, being necessarily existent, being the creator, whatever it is. Nothing in the words forces you to say that God knows the difference between good and bad. Let's read the Rashi again. Rashi here is doing something very, very sophisticated, very, uh, you know, uh, become like one of us, or like the being who is one, unique among us, lo, he is unique among the terrestrial ones, man is. He's different from all the other terrestrial creatures. Even as I am unique among the celestial ones, that's the likeness. He's unique below and I'm unique above. Now you'll ask, well, in what way is he unique below? Oh, I'll answer to you. And in what does his uniqueness consist, man's uniqueness below? In knowing good and evil. 
which is not so in the case of cattle and beasts. Rashi is clearly denying that this verse says God knows the difference between good and evil. That's a very sharp thing for Rashi to do. Now, just to complete the picture, let me tell you what the Rambam says here. The Rambam says something astonishing. He punctuates the verse differently. He punctuates it differently. He says, man has become unique, comma, and then what the verse, what the English says, among us, mimenu, can mean among us, and it can mean from himself. It can be singular or plural. It's a, it's a very uh, flexible phrase. And he reads it like this. Behold, man has become unique, comma, knowing from himself good and evil. Mimenu wow. means from himself, singular, referring to Adam. His uniqueness consists in the fact that he knows from himself good and evil. And Maimonides explains this in the Laws of Repentance in the following way. He says, man, with his own knowledge and with his own understanding, knows what is good and evil. And that is his uniqueness. He has it as an inherent quality of knowing what is good and evil. And that's a gigantic contribution to philosophy. I'm not going to talk about that at the, at, at the moment. I just want to answer one semi-skeptical, critical remark that I hear all the time. Oh, of course, Rabbi. Because Maimonides was a Spanish-trained philosopher. He was a medieval philosopher. So he takes the verse and he twists, he repunctuates it, puts a comma in the wrong place, according to this stupid critic. He puts a comma in the wrong place. And he, and he and repunctuates it. He takes the word bimenu and attaches it to his knowledge. He says that he knows from himself. Yeah, what do you expect from a medieval Spanish philosopher? Uh-huh. But Unclus, the Roman convert who gave us the Aramaic translation, translated it in exactly the same way a thousand years before. So don't talk to me about Spanish philosophers. You take a look at Unclus here. Uh, those of you who can follow in the, in the, in the Aramaic. Um, 22 is in the, in the middle of page 18 in the column of Uklus. Hashem Elohim. Hashem Elohim said, Ha Adam have a ba'alma. This man has become unique in the whole world. Minei lemeida tav ubish. From himself knowing good and evil. Exactly Rush. And by the way, Maimonides quotes Unclus as the source. And that is an entirely different, but this explanation also does not say that God knows good and evil. And Maimonides would deny that with full force. Knowing good and evil is a corruption of the mind. It's a corruption and, de and, de and, and destruction of the mind. That's what, you look in the second chapter of the, of the guide, you can see that in great detail. But it's very important, therefore, to know that the words in the verse do not directly imply that God knows the difference, that knows good and evil. That's very important. Yeah, you have a question? Does it seem that at this time, then man intuitively knew what was good and bad? Or what does it mean that man knew the difference between good and bad? So I'll tell you briefly, because this is a long subject. Um, good and bad here means the principles of good and evil. But there's a long distance between the principles of good and evil on the one hand and judgments in practical life as to what one should do. That depends also on a gigantic amount of factual knowledge so as to apply the principles correctly. Is it important to honor your parents? Yes. Suppose that unbeknownst to you, you've been adopted. You don't carry the genes of this couple. You carry the genes of another couple somewhere else. Because I know this and you don't. I know that your moral principle of honoring your parents isn't being applied because you don't even know who your parents are. These people, you may have gratitude uh, to them. They may treat you nicely. But the obligation of honoring your parents, you're not fulfilling at all because you don't know who your parents are. We're talking now about general principles of good and evil. And, my mind, and of course, Adam was 
was created without that and got it from eating the tree. Before that, he had something superior, what Maimonides called the knowledge of Emerson and Shekhar, which is much superior. That's why it says, Maimonides says that good and evil are a corruption of the mind, not an elevation of the mind, not a great gift of the mind. It's a corruption vis-a-vis what he had before. That's a long story, uh, which we could do on, an, on another occasion, perhaps. But then, in this context, to attribute the knowledge of good and evil to God, God embodies Emerson and Shekhar, which are the principal, fundamental, Absolute categories of existence. Tov and Ra are relative, and they're, they're from a mind that can only see a narrow part of the, of the, of the context, and from a warped sense of the, of the ultimate principles. Not something, not something to be proud of. At any rate, um, it, but Rashi's, Rashi's commentary here, I think, is very, very subtle. That the similarity is not in knowing good and evil. Similarity is in being unique. And knowing good and evil is simply the explanation of what way we are unique. That's all. Okay, so, so anyway. Have a wonderful. Oh, I'm going to see you for Shabbos. I'll be here for Shabbos. Yeah.